Coming up, the tile workshop that built Rome and Sirencester, return to the nests of Brodger, a new mystery for Stonehenge, and the archaeology of space. Welcome to Time Team News, your monthly look at archaeology news and discoveries from Britain and across the globe. And now, space, but more on that later. Well, we've got a jam-packed episode lined up for you this month. We've got Book of the Month, another old Time Team friend drops in, and the latest news to hit the headlines. So let's get started. Well, as you may have seen, we've just released our latest vision for Time Team. There's a host of exciting things in the pipelines, ranging from upcoming episode releases to a three-day dig at the village of Norton Disney, the ancestral home of the famous Disney family following the Norman Conquest. We're launching a new podcast and Series 19 is coming to the Classics channel on YouTube. Plus, we have some bold aspirations that are only possible with your support including a trio of Roman digs, a potential time team convention, and further ventures into our virtual world. To achieve this, we've set a new target of 15,000 Patreon members by the end of 2025. It's an ambitious one, but we can do it with your help. And you can find out more in the video by following the link below. Now, Rome wasn't built in a day, but recent excavations have revealed how one of Roman Britain's major towns was built. Back in Series 7, Time Team visited Sirencester and uncovered a beautifully preserved Roman mosaic in the back garden of a family's terraced house. In recent years, archaeologists have been investigating an industrial site at nearby Mainty in Wiltshire that's been yielding an array of fired Roman tiles. Today it might look like any other field, but 2,000 years ago it was a major industrial hub manufacturing tiles that were used to build Corinium or modern-day Sirencester. The excavation has been led by Cotswold Archaeology, including old Time Team friend Neil Holbrook. We visited the site to find out more. Well, we're here in Mainty, a tiny little village on the Wiltshire-Gloucestershire border, about six miles south of Sirencester. I'd always remember from when I first came to the West Country 30 years ago, that it's always said that Mainty was the source of all the Roman tiles used to build the Roman town of Sirencester. You know, a huge, a big town, second largest town of Roman Britain. And, you know, my hopes were modest at the start. I hoped that maybe we could find a tile kiln and maybe we might even find some stamped tiles. And these stamped tiles are something which Mainty is known for. Within the first three hours of the dig, they come down onto the top of the tile kiln and have produced three bits of stamped tile. So my, my, you know, my hopes are the answer in, in, on day one, morning one. And from there, it's just grown and grown and grown. So what we've now discovered is a really impressive Roman tile kiln, over a hundred stamped tiles, and got a, an amazing story about how this little locality, which now seats in the middle of a field in North Wiltshire, in fact was a locality where they produced Roman building materials that stretched for 50 or more miles in all directions. Uh, at this end we've got roof tiles and, and um, roof tiles are these ones and this one is quite heavy. Uh, that's a tegula and it's, um, that's the sort of standard size. This is an imbrex, which is the bit that covers the gaps on the tegulae as they go up the, the, the roof. We've got five different uh, sets of stamps that start TPF. So we've got TPF on its own, TPF A, TPF B, TPF C and TPF P. TPF probably stands for Tegularia Publicae Facurunt, so made in the public tile works. Made in the public tile works of Sirencester, Roman Corinium. If that is right, then this would have been the municipal tile works for the town council. Uh, um, and A, B, C and P 
would have represented different uh, contractors running the, the, the kiln on behalf of the council. And that you know, uh, is quite a remarkable sort of find. It parallels a similar sort of situation we found in Gloucester where they have tiles uh, stamped RPG for Ray's Publicae Glevensium, so Town Council of, of Gloucester. All of the TPF uh, stamps are, are basically found in Sirencester, which you know, reinforces the fact that this is the public tile works for Sirencester. Um, working on the kiln has been a, yeah, a great opportunity to see some real sort of yeah, meaty archaeology really. It's not just sort of vague sort of smudges in the ground which is a lot of things we work on. It's, it's really nice to be able to see um, see some archaeology and actually really understand how it worked and exactly what it is when you first look at it. So this is the um, latest kiln on the Mine T Brandius farm site and as you can see we have the, the central flue which is surviving really well here. Almost um, five meters in length going down to here and then we have a central drain, all stamped with the TPFP stamps on it. And that comes out and that funnels into a, well, a massive series of drains here. You can see the, box, the lovely box through drain down here. And then a central culvert as well. And then out the front here, we have this line of tiles, which we believe was a, a barrow run. So when they were raking out the flue at the end of the process, they were using that to take all the material away to the, the waste pit over the far side. And what's been great is that we've, this is a chance for the professional archaeologists from Cotswold Archaeology to work with local volunteers and it's such a great relationship. You know, we get so much back from the volunteers in terms of their enthusiasm. It's great fun being a volunteer because the archaeologists are so uh, interesting, they keep you informed, um, they get you involved and uh, although we're amateurs we do feel very much part of the team. It's great to get people who this is their local heritage on site and also they're, you know, particularly well, with all of them to teach them skills, what archaeologists actually do, what it takes to go from uh, knowing that there's a site there to actually being able to tell a story about the past. It's brilliant that there's a kiln here, but what does that mean about the people who were using it? What was their day to day like? What was their life like? It's, it's that story that I'm interested in, yeah. And coming soon over on Patreon, an exclusive interview with Neil Holbrook, reliving some of his favourite Time Team moments over the years. You may remember from one of our earlier episodes that John Gator travelled to the Orkney Islands off the north coast of Scotland to visit the Ness of Brodgar, an incredible Neolithic site that he helped to discover over 20 years ago. This summer, John has returned for the final year of excavation there. And that brings us very neatly to our book of the month. Ness of Brodgar, Past, Present and Future, a commemorative companion volume to the 2024 season by Professor Mark Edmonds. And we caught up with Mark on site to find out more. So here we are, uh, sheltering behind a spoil heap um, in the evening on the penultimate day of the last season of work at the Ness of Brodka. So that's 20 years of work uh, culminating in the last day of digging tomorrow. Um, over the course of the last 20 years, we've tried to create um, a range of publications, monitoring the, the progress of our work, throwing up new results, um, trying to get the story of the Ness across to people um, in lots of different ways. Um, the latest of which is this one, uh, the Ness of Brodka, Past, Present and Future. The book's been produced to coincide with an exhibition which is currently on at the Orkney Museum in Kirkwall, just opposite the Cathedral, and that runs through until the end of September. It's called Past, Present and Future because it's about the Neolithic, the past of the site, uh, and the history of what this place was and what it meant to people over the course of 1500 years or so. It's about the present because it's also about the project that we've undertaken, and it's about the future because Although we're putting down our tools and stopping digging uh, tomorrow, uh, we have several years of post-excavation work to do, um, which gives us the chance to really draw out all the detail from our, from our work and decide how we want to tell the story of this remarkable place. So this book is designed to give a flavour of the kind of things that we've found, um, but it's also prompting a series of questions, the, the things that we think are the big themes that need to be addressed as we work through all of our evidence and pull it together into some kind of narrative. 
Um, the book contains lots of pictures, um, of including material that we've discovered over the years, um, remarkable artefacts like some of the mace heads, many made on local stone, others made on stone that's been imported from other regions. Um, we've also got in the exhibition and in the book um, examples of the, the kinds of carvings that we find on some of the on some of the structures, including the so-called Brogga butterfly, which is um, found on many structures and on small pieces of stone across the site. There's also a lot of information on the character of the, of the walls that define some of the remarkable pieces of architecture that were constructed here over a period of 1500 years or so. And information on the history of the site the different phases over which different buildings were constructed, reworked, embellished and demolished through time. So a range of different things that have been uh, recovered during the course of our 20 years and a series of reflections on um, the kind of things that have really struck our imaginations during the course of the fieldwork. So this book contains quite a few objects that individuals have discovered. So it's a, it's a kind of way of bringing all those objects together in a way that hopefully catches the imaginations of the reader, but also stands as a nice record of the things that have mattered to us while we've been working here. Ness of Brodga, Past, Present and Future, is available now on the official Ness of Brodga website, and we've put the link to that in the description box below. And while we're looking at reading materials, Wessex Archaeology have recently released a new online library featuring an array of publications available open source, including many Time Team reports. And we've got Dr Stuart Eve of Wessex Archaeology with us here to tell us more. Hi Stu, how are you? Hi Danny, yeah I'm good thanks, I'm good, how are you doing? Great thanks, so tell us about this new archive then. Sure. So uh, today, I guess uh, I'm very proud to announce that we've just recently launched the Wessex Archaeology Open Library. So it's a digital resource which brings together about 40, over 45 years of archaeological research from uh, undertaken by Wessex Archaeology. So as you know, Wessex are an archaeological charity. We undertake fieldwork and research across the UK, but also internationally. And we create hundreds of reports a year and we put out all sorts of books and everything. And we wanted to find a way to kind of share all of that with everyone. And so, of course, we thought the best way to do this was to create a digital platform um, so that we can share that data with as many people as possible. So currently we've got about 75 of our, of our full monographs, including many of our titles which have been out of print. Um, and then I think we've got, at the moment, we've got about 155 reports or so, but we're, we're adding to those every week. And for Time Team fans, there's quite a few books and reports in there from authored by awesome. Time Team favourites, such as Jackie uh, McKinley and, of course, Wessex Archaeology's own Phil Harding. Fantastic. And how can we access it? Basically, it's pretty easy to access. You just go to uh, www wessexarchaeologylibrary.org. We've also got a kind of climate friendly print on demand service. So if there's any of those books there that you want to uh, you want to actually have a paper copy of and put in your library at home or whatever, put on your bookshelf. Um, there's an option there too. You just click print on demand and then it will just make one copy for you instead of us doing huge print runs that, that never get put anywhere. That sounds great. Thanks, Stu. Yeah, great. And um, well, see you soon, hopefully. Yes, yeah, see you on an excavation soon. Next, a quick shout out to the Young Archaeologists Club at the Museum of Cannock Chase in Staffordshire, jointly run by our very own Penny Lock. They recently celebrated their 10th birthday this year. Congratulations to you all and keep up the good work. Now Stonehenge, a site that continues to reveal new secrets with each passing year. Now it's long been known that the smaller blue stones on the outer circle of Stonehenge travelled many miles from the Preseli Mountains in Wales. Now new research confirms 
that the altar stone travelled from much further afield, most likely Scotland and perhaps even the Orkney Isles. Geological analysis of the stone's fabric shows it couldn't have come from England or Wales and that it likely stems from a geology known as the Old Red Sandstone in the Orcadian Basin, a formation that stretches across northeast Scotland into the Orkney Isles. The process works by matching the unique geological fingerprint to a specific rock formation found in a particular area. It's a process of elimination and determining where it definitely could not have come from is just as important when narrowing down the search. Weighing over six tonnes, the megalith was probably transported by boat. But why? One theory had suggested the blue stones from Priscelli were part of a complete stone circle that had originally been installed locally in Wales before later being relocated to Stonehenge. Given that Orkney is known for its own stone circles, could the altar stone originally have been part of one of these before being relocated? There's already evidence in the area of links to the Orkney Isles, the discovery of grooved ware pottery near Stonehenge, a style that originated on Orkney. That's the wonderful thing about Stonehenge and doing research from different disciplines on one monument. There's always new secrets to be revealed. The new study was published in the journal Nature and we've put the link in the description box below. And finally, it was only a matter of time, but an emerging field of scientific study is the archaeology of space. Many artefacts have been left on the moon from the various missions over the years and with the prospect of several separate lunar missions in development and astronauts returning to the moon, the possibility of investigating 50-year-old space junk is growing ever more likely. Elsewhere, archaeological principles are now being applied in the International Space Station, taking the concept of a test pit, or a shovel test pit as often referred to in the States. Investigators are studying how the use of six designated areas on board the station have evolved over time. The research demonstrates that the study of how humans interact with and adapt to their environment can be applied anywhere, whether that's a muddy field in Britain or orbiting thousands of miles above the Earth. According to the researchers, by applying a very traditional method for sampling a site to a completely new kind of archaeological context, we show how the ISS crew uses different areas of the space station in ways that diverge from designs and mission plans. The results have been published in the scientific journal PLOS One and we've put the link in the description box below. Well, that's it for this month. Additional content from Time Team News can be found over on our Patreon channel, including 3D models and extended interviews. And please do remember to subscribe and press the notification bell to receive all the latest updates. And from next month, we're going to be moving to a Wednesday slot. So that's all from me for now, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Join Time Team on Patreon to access exclusive 3D models, masterclasses, and behind the scenes insights.